Ok. Euh, excusez, je parle un très petit peu de français. Et parce que c'est en anglais. And I'll be talking about uh, some of the software-defined radio work that I've been doing over the past few years. So my name is Paul Boven. This is my ham radio call sign. This is where I work, the Joint Institute for VLBI in Europe. And this is my hobby, and they're not even 300 meters apart, which is really nice. So the Dwingelo radio telescope was opened in April 1956 by Her Maj Majesty the Queen of Holland. The Netherlands. It's a 25 meter dish um, and it can rotate on these wheels so it can fully rotate in every direction. It's made of a steel mesh and we use it of course for radio astronomy. And at that time when it was opened it was the largest radio telescope in the world. Eventually it got eclipsed by newer and better instruments and it became disused and it became basically a Rune, a hazard area you could not approach without a hard hat because parts were falling off. You, ha you ran the risk of being hit by a piece of metal. And then a group of volunteers came together and said, can we rescue this very important and historic instrument? And we created a foundation after the first engineer that ran this telescope, the C.A. Muller Radio Astronomy Station. Uh, we now have over 300 sponsors. We have at least 50 active volunteers, all kinds of volunteers licensed radio amateurs, people interested in amateur radio astronomy, people interested in the mechanics of the dish, people interested in teaching and outreach in telling other people about radio astronomy and, uh, and science. And as a foundation we have three goals. To make the telescope available to the community of amateur radio astronomers and radio amateurs. To stimulate the interest in science and technology, in particular uh, by offering access to the telescope and preserving and maintaining it, and of course using it ourselves. Which is a lot of work, just to give you an idea, cleaning it, getting the rust off, putting fiber in the ground. This is the, uh, the feed horn for L-band, which was actually driven from the west of Holland all the way to the east of Holland where we are, and surprisingly, nobody got arrested with having that on their car. And this is just not even all of our volunteers, I hope this image it's a little bit visible over there. Uh, it, it's a fairly large and very diverse and very fun group as well. But of course, you want to hear about technology, about software-defined radio. And this is the software-defined radio that I built for this telescope. So you have the dish, and right here in the focal point is the low noise amplifier. You want that as close as possible to the antenna. Um, then we mix it down in frequency and we end up at uh, we subtract 1 gigahertz, so we end up at 420 megahertz. Then it goes into a receiver, and the receiver is actually a communications receiver from Rode and Swartz company, and that was donated to us by the former Dutch Aviation Authority, because this thing spent like 10 years in, a, in the tower of an aircraft. Uh, um, what's, what's the English word here? Um, Aviodron? Uh, um, fly where airplanes land, sorry, I'm losing my English. Yeah, thank you, airport. Uh, sorry, <laughs> too, many, too many languages. All of this is locked to a 10 megahertz uh, frequency standard, rubidium, uh, and the output of this receiver is at 21.4 megahertz, and it is not de demodulated or anything, it is actually a wideband output that is originally intended for a panoramic display where you can see all the neighboring frequency signals. And that then goes into the back end, which is the subject of this presentation, which consists of an AD converter, an FPGA, and an Ethernet driver, and then it goes to a PC with some storage. And the bandwidth we have is about, it's centered around 21.4 megahertz, and we get 15 megahertz at each side of it, approximately. Uh, we sample it at 70 megahertz, and we get uh, uh, something close to 30, uh, sorry, something close to uh, 30 megahertz uh, usable spectrum. So this is a pretty picture of the block diagram, and this is the reality. Wow. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> what? Over, over here it shows. This is ridiculous. Okay, I will have to skip that slide. I, I can see it over here, this is strange. Um, 
Oh yeah, maybe the, there is a problem with the colors. So if, yeah. if you use like a certain color, maybe it's not it's not appealing. Well, and this oh, okay. is this is a photograph. There's many colors in it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's very strange. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, well, let's move on. Um, this is the AD converter. These are two um, op amps. So this is for scale. The uh, this is a half a millimeter between the legs, soldered by hand. This is the first PCB I ever designed, and some of the traces were a bit thin, so they've been reinforced with some extra wire. Uh, but still, all in all, this is working. And it, uh, it's an AD converter. It's officially specified for a clock rate of 65 megahertz. We slightly overclock it at 70. And this is the FPGA, and unfortunately, it's one of those ball grid arrays that nobody even thinks about soldering. So I bought a little experimental board that has the FPGA in it, that has a Ethernet chip in here, that has a one gigabit Ethernet output. And that's basically all that we use from the boards. The rest, like this and this, is not really used. And this connection, I'm not even sure what the original intended application was, but this is where the, FP, where the AD converter connects to it. And this is the whole setup in my kitchen table around 2008. So this is the FPGA again. This is the AD converter now upside down, with just a little bit of ribbon cable in between. So this is a source emulating a 1420 megahertz uh, hydrogen line astronomical signal, goes into this mixer. This is a one gigahertz that we mix with it. It goes into this receiver that I already mentioned. And out of it comes the IF signal that goes into the AD converter and then over the ethernet you can just about, in the spectral line display, you can see what is happening. Um, well, this was in 2008, and really. <laughs> can I see? It's very strange. Yeah, well, it, it, it is, it's a perfectly normal slide. Ah, yeah. oh, that's strange. This one works, that one doesn't. That one works. Yeah. That, that one, ah, oh, this is... Oh, no, now it's here. Yeah. Oh, let's see if we can go back to... Yeah, Hi! It okay, <laughs> this is uh, very serious. <sighs> Sorry. Um, this is the whole setup as it is currently built into the telescope. Uh, these are the antennas, the antenna signals, and it takes a little bit of an interesting route. Antenna six, so signal, down converter, then it goes to the receiver, and then it goes to the back end. Skip this, skip this, skip this, skip this. So in 2008, I had it built, and then finally in 2010, uh, it became this setup. Again, the FPGA board, the AD converter. These are the input signals. This is the clock, which comes from the uh, rubidium. Eventually, power supply. Um, to program it, we use a parallel port using, the, uh, using JTAG. So I basically just took a JTAG adapter, cut off the wire, and soldered it to a connection. Um, this is what it looks like in operation. It will show you what mode it is programmed in because there are different firmwares um, and the clock fre frequency. Now what's inside the FPG FPGA is what actually makes the thing thick. Um, this is the AD converter, which is external to the FPGA. Then the data gets ingested at 70 mega sample per second, 10 bit uh, AD converter. And we're going to do an FFT, and in order to do an FFT, you first need to apply a window. So this, this ROM contains the window. Every incoming sample is multiplied by, by a value in the window. It goes into this ROM, and this, this block is dual port RAM, so I can write in it from one side, I can read it from the other side, and it goes into the FFT. And out of the FFT, as you're probably used to, we get the real data and the imaginary component. Each of those gets squared, so, and after summing those, Actually, over here we have the power for that particular frequency bin. Uh, so, so this one gets sequentially gets samples in, and then sequentially repeating it gets all the different frequencies out. Um, and then, in order to actually get some sensitivity, we put it into a RAM, and then we sequently uh, accumulate. So, when frequency bin one comes out of here, we add frequency one. Etc. And if you've done it 64 times, we make an Ethernet packet that contains one whole spectrum and that dumps it out to the PC. 
So at the moment, there are, uh, these are the three main personalities that I wrote for the backend. Uh, Pulsar mode, you take 512 samples, apply the window function, 256 bit, this gives you 256 bins of frequency space, integrate 64 times. That gives you this much resolution in frequency space and it dumps out 2000 spectra per, per seconds, which you need to look at fast pulsars. If you don't know what a pulsar is, we'll get to it. If you want to do spectral line observing, in, uh, we need more frequency resolution, but that takes some, um, that means I need more samples to put into the FFT, so I did take 4096 samples, gives me 2048 bins, I do the same integration. Now I have a resolution of 6, 17 kilohertz, I can talk louder, and it gives me 267 spectra per second, and that's still way too much, I still need to average down these values. Now if you want to do really interesting stuff, um, you can also stream the raw samples out of the thing. That is a little bit complicated because it is 70 mega sample per second times 10 bit is 700 megabit. Uh, so you need to run the thing in gigabit ethernet mode. Uh, and it gives you 700, it gives you 300 gigabyte per hour of data. So you have to be very careful. But we use this for instance for decoding GPS satellite signals um, and doing very fine frequency resolution observing. So I mentioned pulsars. I mentioned pulsars. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this has never ever happened before. Yeah. Pulsars are the remnants of a large star that has gone supernova and exploded, and the core is completely collapsed due to its own gravity, and even the atoms get smashed together, so you only are left with a very compact core of neutrons. They typically have mass that is still slightly higher than that of the sun, but a diameter of only 20 kilometers. So imagine 20 kilometers pressed together, with the whole mass of the sun. It's extremely dense. A single teaspoon of that matter would weigh as much as the whole Himalaya. And of course, you don't have a, a teaspoon, you have like um, 20 kilometers of it. Now, if you have something that is heavy and it collab collapses, it will actually speed up due to conversation, conservation of angular momentum. It will go faster. And these will originally, when it happens, they end up rotating tens to hundreds of times per second, and then <laughs> over millions of years, it will slowly slow down. So over here, you see uh, the signal. What we get is little beeps of little increases of noise uh, in time, and over here, you see the time axis, and you see over here, three pulses of this pulsar. The frequency of observing is over here, so this is around 400 megahertz, and we are just about sensitive enough to see these individual pulses. So you see that they repeat. You also see that they're slanted because the actual index of refraction of the uh, vacuum between the pulsar and us, which goes through the Milky Way, is not entirely equal to that of the speed of light. There's a very small difference. And over the thousands of years that this signal has passed, this has given a difference of, say, a tenth of a second between the upper and the lower frequency. This is an effect called dispersion. And that actually allows us to measure the density of the matter between the pulsar and us. Over here, you can hopefully see these slanted, there, there, there. You see those slanted lines, those are the pulsar signal coming in. All the other horizontal stuff that you see is all RFI, other uses of the frequency spectrum that we happily throw out so that we only have left with the pulsar signal. So this particular pulsar has the uh, prosaic name of B0329 plus 54, which are basically its coordinates. It is the brightest pulsar in the Northern Hemisphere. It's 3,460 light years away. So every, every pulse that arrives has actually been traveling since about the time when the pyramids were built. It has a period of 0 0.71452 seconds. And we can detect, as you see, the single pulses, and we can also, on a nice subwoofer, make them audible for the uh, public visiting our telescope. So that's what we do with pulsar mode. We also have the hydrogen mode, the line mode, which has higher spectral resolution. And this was an image made in basically one day, tracking along the plane of our galaxy. Our galaxy is like a flat disk that we're in. And if you go along the equ equator of this disk, 
then you see the hydrogen line and the hydrogen is, has a neutral frequency of 1420.405, which is basically over here. So any hydrogen that you see higher is actually uh, coming towards us. Any hydrogen that you see lower is actually moving away from us. And you see structure as we look at zero degrees towards the center of the galaxy. At 180 degrees, we look away from the center of the galaxy. And the structures you see over here, in these bands, you can actually project them on a, on a rotating map and then you will actually get the spiral arms of our Milky Way galaxy. But all of this is still not about GNU Radio. I built this in 2008 and back then I have to say GNU Radio was not terribly useful yet. It has improved massively so I decided to, uh, to, to join this exciting project and the first thing I did is I made a new firmware again for the back end and this firmware at the input, you still get the 70 mega sample per second of the AD, AD converter. We multiply it with a sine wave at 21.4 megahertz, because that is the actual center frequency of the receiver. And I want to pick out the best 5 megahertz of it. So I made a fur, based, fur filter based uh, filter for it. First I made a one stage filter, but that not, did not perform very well. And for enough performance, it would not fit in my little tiny FPGA. But a cascaded filter works much better. So this is the I and this is the Q. Over here they get interleaved and then they get on the Ethernet. And this is actually the same format that you're using in radio, interleaved I and Q 16 bits. I can simply put this into a flowchart. One of those flowcharts is over here and I will not go into detail about this one because it actually is part of the presentation that I'm allowed to do later today. But you see here, UDP source, uh, this port, you get packets of 8192 bytes, which are just samples. Uh, you go interleave shorts to complex, and you can do your standard new radio flowchart stuff. And with this particular flowchart, we get some very nice resolution and frequency. This particular source is a, a galaxy called N74. Um, this is an observation of uh, 2300 seconds on source and 2400 off source free. So we keep switching back to on the subject and off, on and off, so that we can compare the noise level. And the difference here is a small fraction of a percent of the noise level actually. But by integrating long enough, we're able to see this. This particular source is um, 30 million light years away from us. And because the universe is expanding, it's moving away from us. So the original 1420.4 megahertz hydrogen line is actually shifted by 3.1 megahertz uh, to this frequency. Now, the other reason I built this particular film firmware is that we have a group within our organization that is very active with Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, SETI. Now, this is extremely interesting, but also a very daunting puzzle. And the issue here is that you need to do an enormous amount of signal processing to determine if a signal is possibly of interesting origin, or yet another satellite or mobile phone or whatever. Um, and we didn't feel like writing our own software. So if, in fact, we adopted the SETI at Home from Berkeley project. And you might actually be familiar with this screensaver that they made available. Uh, we are now working to get our, our recorded data compatible with that screensaver setup. That is a lot of work. Uh, a lot of volunteers involved in it. I'm only doing the signal processing part. And that particular kind of data is sampled at 2.5 mega sample per second. Uh, I and Q data, and it's only sampled at a 1 bit, 1 bit sampling only. And that's what you see happening here. This is again the 5 mega sample per sample coming out of the back end, turning them into complex numbers. We throw away half of it so we have 2.5 megahertz of spectrum. We have a little FFT so we can see what's happening. We turn them into float numbers, we interleave them, and then if it's lower than zero, it's a zero. If it's lower than float zero, it becomes a zero. If it's higher, it becomes a float, an integer one. We pack that into a bits and we send it to, to a file. And we now have all the software that, that we can actually do this because this particular screenshot is from our own SETI at home work stream. Uh, we're almost there to actually do this, and this year at the large SETI conference, we're hoping to actually launch and make public our own uh, SETI project. 
So, <sighs> sorry about this. I, I, I'm going to throw this computer away after this talk, after the next talk. Uh, all of this VHDL is available, it's open source. It is on the Camera's GitLab server. And you could look at it, but I would not recommend it because VHDL is something that I do every few years, so it's probably not very good, but it works. Um, oh God, damn it. sorry, I should not have said that. More backends. A while ago, I bought myself a little Atus B210. Well, you probably know all the specs, I'm not gonna uh, repeat them here. And we're using it for pulse timing because it has not only a reference frequency input, but also a reference time input. And we use it at the moment for tracking a recently launched Chinese lunar mission that is actually making their flow chart for decoding the signal available uh, on GitHub. So you can just load that and, and, and we use this for observing it. Um, and this is a flow chart I made for pulsar data processing. And because we can now add proper timing, we can do something like this. This is the same pulsar again, but now timed for 18,000 revolutions, so that's about three hours. And this line is, if you have the exact timing right, and from this we deduce that the actual rotation period at this moment of the pulsar, well, uh, on the 28th, is 0 0.7144921 seconds. So we can already get this to seven seconds accuracy. If you can improve this just a little bit, we actually start seeing the Doppler effect of the Earth moving around the Sun, which brings us closer and further away from the pulsar, and even the rotation of our observation observatory, which is on the Earth, which is also turning. If you take out those effects, we should be able to see the pulsar getting slower and slower. In the future, we go even a step higher. Uh, we recently managed to obtain a Atus X310, um, that has two optical outputs and we like optical outputs because we can put the whole thing in a metal box so it doesn't spew out lots of RFI and you're not uh, interfering with your own observations and it gives us lots of bandwidth and bandwidth for many of our observations equals uh, to sensitivity. And we bought it with two of the twin, twin RX modules because we're mostly interested in receiving. And one of the reasons that we want to use this is to do VLBI which is very long baseline interferometry, where you make a synthesis telescope consisting of radio telescopes all over the world. Now, f in order to do this, you need an extremely accurate clock. Uh, uh, in fact, if you do this at, uh, at high frequencies, you need at least a hydrogen maser. And hydrogen masers cost like 300,000 each, which is very expensive, and which we as a volunteer organization cannot possibly afford. So instead, we're borrowing the clock signal from the nearby professional Westerbork array, and using a wide rabbit link, uh, which is a timing dissemination protocol, to, to get over fiber, bring that signal from Westerbork to Dwingelo. It's, it, it's only like um, 35 kilometers of fiber, which is not very much. To, so to make it a little bit challenging, we actually go from Westerbork north for about 40 kilometers and then south again, and using public fiber from the Dutch uh, network re research infrastructure called ServNet. And all of this is actually part of a Horizon 2020 project, which uh, neatly got us this device. And of course, we will also be using this for our pulsar observation, our hydrogen line, all the other stuff that we're doing. So this is a little um, introduction of what we're doing with GNU Radio and with software-defined radio. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, okay. for this very impressive presentation. Is there any question for, for Paul about this work? So just a, uh, I don't know, it might be a trivial question, but you, you present your, your flow chart where you're collecting the data and then doing your 4096 BNFFT in yeah. real time and then streaming this data on the internet. Why for radio telescope measurement do you need to stream continuous data sets? Why, why can't you just get chunks of data, process the FFT, send them to a computer and then take another chunk uh, later? Why? I actually have a slide about that in my next presentation. Okay. But, but briefly, um, your sensitivity, how accurately you can measure the noise, measure the noise power, 
goes with the square root of the number of samples that you process. Now, doing this takes time, and you want like millions of them. So, if you have a, if you were to do an FFT, send it to the PC, FFT it. Uh, sorry, if you were to sample it, FFT it, uh, and then go go along and do the next one, you are losing time. You have that time. You have very little amount of time. And this is really the subject of my next presentation, but that is extremely inefficient because then in order to get a number of large number of samples, if you like only using 1% of your actual observing time and you're throwing away the rest, <coughs> then um, your observation takes 100 times longer and what is a one hour ex uh, thing now becomes a four day observation. So lowering the noise level is, is, is yeah. leading to a sort of a punching yeah. screen. And, and not, not lowering it, determining it more accurately so you can see where the signal is higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're averaging, 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 and so the uncertainty gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and that allows you to distinguish the places where you have something interesting happening. Uh, you seem to have a good experience in the VHF development. Uh, although you said it was <laughs> yeah. years ago. Um, you, you were mentioning RF NOC. Have you yes. ever tried it and what do you think about it? Um, I, I have studied it. I have not actually tried it yet. Uh, my understanding is that if you have like the X310, you have a firmware that has a number of predefined blocks. And you can have up to, I think, 16 of those blocks inside your, uh, inside, uh, that you can use. Uh, unfortunately, those do not include all of the blocks that I would need, so this is going to be extra challenging in the sense that we will need to be developing our own blocks. So, which is either VHDL or maybe, what's the other one, Verilog actually, um, which I'm even less familiar with. But I have a complete flowchart chart working that processes the output of the TwinRx. Uh, there's no way to do it in real time on the PC, so it, it needs to go to uh, FPGA eventually, but for the first uh, proof of concept that we're going to do, we just record it to your PC, run it to your flowchart, see how long it takes. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, curious and slightly worried about doing this in RF lab. I think that, that would summarize it. it. It was supposed to simplify the, the FPGA development. Yeah. I, personally, I, I don't think it's so simple as, as they. Uh, they say it. Yeah, it, it, from looking at it, it's quite likely that I'll just make one big block, one RF not block that does all the stuff that I need, um, and not try and connect all of these little blocks together. Gwen, maybe you might want to comment about RF Gwen, Gwen has spent some time, so he spent like three months investigating RF not, developing his custom block, integrating in RF not. Um, uh, integrating something uh, in the RF not is uh, quite easy because uh, it's uh, correctly uh, input output it's exactly the same idea as the um, software uh, block for the audio but uh, the main problem is uh, the complexity to understand and, the, and finally my, my problem is, uh, my goal is to use RF knock on a non USRP board mm -hmm. and it's just not possible yeah. The, uh, it not, the firmware may be easy to, to be uh, ported on new board, but uh, the UID <coughs> is just awful and not documented at all to, yeah. to be, to be uh, adapted. Yeah. So I, I think the basic conclusion is that when you wanted to develop your own custom block, there was the equivalent for RF node from the GR mod 2, so they will give you the, the, the basic yes. directory structure and they will give you the, the template, the skeleton for, for, yes. the, for the basic layout. Um, the um, the GR mod 2 um, for RF node, RF node, RF node, RF node, RF node, RF node provide a basic set of files and you, have, you just have to plug your code mm -hmm. on the top provided by, uh, by this yeah. tool. And it's a it's really interesting approach, but it's, it's I'm, I'm not sure uh, for the uh, USRP it's perfect. Mm -hmm. For the rest, I'm not sure yeah. the interest, uh, because it's a big, big firmware, and it's, uh, it's mandatory to have a 
quite big uh, FPGA for doing maybe something other, nothing or strict minimum. Yeah, the interconnecting the communication was quite heavy with the FPGA before the packet being routed from one block to another, so I think it was a limitation. Okay. Well, maybe I can uh, talk to you during lunch, lunch or so if you have any uh, examples to show and that uh, frighten me. And it will improve your French because when ah. you implemented everything in French again. So ah, très bien, oui. Je le parle un très petit peu, mais je ne le comprends pas. So, well, then, you can say. Merci. Just the last question, your, your Chinese moon uh, mission. Yes. Are you tracking the digital communication or the analog uh, telemetry from, from the... No, the, the digital. The digital yeah. data. Well, I, I think we're trying to do all of it, but um, we've, we've actually been successful in decoding packets. Okay. And we actually have Chinese collaborators that come and visit us at the ah. telescope, and they even bring their own USB. Yeah? Yeah. It's, it's quite a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you very much for